Right, good evening, folks. So this is the talk that's going to bring some balance to the force. This is the anti-microservices talk of the whole conference, I think. Uh, and basically, this talk is about modular monoliths and, and really how to build modular monoliths in Java specifically. I'm sure you've seen this all before. You know, every conference you go to, it's either monoliths versus microservices, and one is better than the other, blah, blah, blah. And we're always kind of battling these two extremes against each other. And of course, the hidden assumption here is if you're building a monolith, it's somehow horrible. Monoliths are evil. And monoliths are basically those horrible, legacy, old, big balls of mud that are hard to change and, and you know, maintain and run and operate and so on and so forth. It doesn't have to be that way. And microservices won't help. If you can't design a monolith properly, microservices will not help because you're basically sticking networks in the way. I think Hadi showed this in his keynote yesterday, didn't he? He said he did. I hope he did. Um, you know, if you can't build monoliths properly, don't go to microservices. I thought it was quite a cool tweet. Got a bunch of retweets, right? Outclassed by the Clippy. 4,000 retweets. I see you have a poorly structured monolith. Would you like me to convert into a poorly structured set of microservices? No, thank you. The way to outclass Clippy is poo. <laughs> right, and we could carry on this meme forever. This is what, not this, but this is the sort of thing we're going to talk about over the next 50 minutes. Uh, who am I? I'm Simon. I'm the author of these two books. Uh, one's about uh, software architecture and really introducing software architecture to developers. Uh, this book here on the right is called The Art of Visualizing Software Architecture. Uh, this one's actually free, so you can go to Lean Pub, slide the price slider to zero, and you can download it for free. I'm also the founder of this thing here called Structurizer. Structurizer is a, um, a software as a service uh, platform basically for building software architecture diagrams. There are two uh, very simple ways this works. Uh, number one, you write some code, you get some diagrams. Number two, you write some text, you get some diagrams. All of the concepts we're going to talk about today, um, I'm actually using myself to build this product. Uh, this product is all cloud-based. It's running on Pivotal Web Services, Cloud Foundry, and all of the techniques you know, at the lower level are all in this product as well. And, and, and really, the whole premise here is that a well-structured code base is easy to visualize. So I, I'm a big fan of uh, visualization and visualization of architecture as a way to help teams think about their software and really understand what their software is all about. And if you have a nice, clean code base, it's really, really easy to do. If you give me your code base and say, Simon, we'd like you to draw us a picture of this code base. And let's say it's 100,000 Java classes over a million lines of code. I'm not going to draw you a single UML class diagram that shows the entire system. 100,000 boxes, 100,000 classes, because that's just too much detail. So when we're drawing architecture diagrams, we'll use abstraction. And abstraction allows us to you know, reason about and simplify our view of a system. It reduces the cognitive load, essentially. And of course, when we talk about architecture, we talk about things like uh, components and modules and services and these sorts of things. And these abstractions help us reason about big or complex systems. Without these abstractions, we have lots of low-level, endless, you know, highly detailed conversations that just take time. That's great, but the abstractions need to reflect the code somehow. So when I'm referring to a module or a service or a component or a layer, I need to be able to find that thing in the code. Make sense? Yeah, so we can have these architecture discussions, and we can point to real things in the code. The problem really here is that we don't have a common vocabulary to describe software. That's an odd thing to say in 2016. We don't have a common language that we as software developers can use to describe software. And I'm not talking about UML and certain types of boxes and lines here. I mean the actual vocabulary we use, the abstractions. Sure, we always use terms like modules or, or maybe components, but what is a component? If I were to poll everybody in this audience, we'd all have our own different ideas of what a component is. Imagine we're building a system composed of a, a, a mobile app talking to a web app talking to a database. For some of you, a component would be the web app. You know, the web application is a component of the entire system, a part of. For other people, a component might be something running inside that web app. So we often use the same term at different levels of abstraction. And again, that tends to confuse a lot of conversations. 
So the way that I do this is, is I, I, I teach teams a very, very simple set of abstractions that we can then use to describe, especially the static structure of a system. Uh, and this is all described in my uh, uh, Art of Visualizing Software Architecture book, which you can download for free. So for me, a software system is made up of a bunch of containers, web apps, databases, file systems, batch processes, standalone applications, mobile apps. Basically, a container is something that runs code or stores data. If you lift the lid on those containers, they're made up of components. So I'm going to use the word component to mean something running inside a container. It's just a grouping of related functionality behind a nice, clean interface. And because I mostly deal with Java, my components are made up of classes. And we're done. So it's a really, really simple tree structure to describe the static structure of a software system. You might have to take this and tweak it if you're using functional languages or database technologies and so on and so forth. Once you have a standard set of abstractions and therefore vocabulary in mind, you can then create some diagrams really, really simply. And this is what I refer to as my C4 model. A context diagram, a container diagram, a set of component diagrams. And if you want to go to that lower level of detail, you can create class diagrams that show the component implementations. And essentially, this is about creating a set of maps. So I live in Jersey in the Channel Islands. If, if you go look up Jersey in Google Maps or something on your smartphone, it will give you this picture down here by default. So it zooms straight into Jersey. And this is great if you want to know what's inside Jersey and what the place names are. If you've never heard of Jersey, it's totally useless. So you have to zoom out, pinch the zoom out to get some context to get to the map of Europe. I want to create similar diagrams as well for software. So sometimes I want the zoomed in view of my system showing components, and at other times, depending on who I'm speaking to, I want to zoom out. Just a really quick example, just to, to uh, put this in context. Uh, I wrote a, a something called techtribes.je. You've probably seen this a million times if you've seen me speak before. It's a super basic content aggregator for the local tech industry. It lists local people, businesses, blog posts, and so on. This is a context diagram for the tech tribe system. So this thing in, in the middle with the monkey, that's my system. It has these different types of users at the top, and it integrates with these systems at the bottom. So it's just, you know, this is the context of tech tribes and how it works. If this was interactive, we could select it, pinch the zoom in, and now we get to level two. This is the container diagram. And this shows you the various containers that make up that tech tribe system. Web app here at the top, standalone process at the bottom, content of data, and some data stores in the middle. If we were interested in this content of data thing, we select it, pinch the zoom in, we get to level three. And this is a component diagram that shows you the internals of that content of data process. It's just a bunch of Java Spring components, essentially. And this is where it gets interesting. So in the top corner here, there's a tweet component. So TechTribes is pulling tweets in from Twitter, and it's throwing them into a Mongo data store. And this tweet component here, basically, it's just a CRUD component. It throws tweets into Mongo and gets them back out again. If we were to select this component and pinch to zoom in, if this is interactive, we get to see level four, the class diagram. In the initial implementation of my tech tribe system, this component looked like that. Essentially, this was a standard, you know, enterprise layered architecture web layer, services layer, data access layer. So I have a tweet service here with an implementation class and a tweet data access object with a Mongo implementation. There's nothing on this picture that says tweet component. So although when I'm having an architecture discussion, I call it the tweet component, it doesn't exist. It's a conceptual thing. And this is where we make that odd, uncomfortable jump between architecture and code. The architecture diagrams say one thing, the code kind of says something different. And when I've run my architecture workshops with people, and I've pointed this out to them on their own code bases, they say things like, yeah, but the component exists conceptually. I'm like, well, I agree, but it's a bit confusing because you have, you have this diagram here and the code here and they don't match. And that's the problem essentially I'm trying to solve here. And really, it comes back to that question I kind of asked originally. You know, does your code reflect the abstractions that you think about? 
So if you have a component on, on an architecture diagram, you need to have a component somewhere in the code. Uh, George Fairbanks has got a great architecture book. He calls this the model code gap. And it's essentially, you know, if you're having an architecture discussion, yeah, we use terms like components and module and, and layer and subsystem, but we can't find these things in the code. If attendees could make their way to the sessions, please, that would be much appreciated. We're closing the exhibit hall. Thank you. I agree, that's an awesome idea. <laughs> so, uh, this, this smaller code gap. So, so, when we're having an architect discussion, we might use the word component. Quick show of hands, who's a Java developer here? Right, it's most people. Is there a component keyword in Java? No. Is there a layer keyword in Java? No. So what we're doing when we're, when we're programming it is we're creating these architectural abstractions using classes, interfaces, packages, namespaces. So for example, something we normally do is we, is we create a layer as a package. You know, we have kind of one package per layer, for example. And that's the model code gap. The terminology is different. The concepts don't necessarily match. This is not a new problem. Um, I found a paper dating back to the 1990s, and it basically says if you ask a software engineer to draw a picture of their system on a whiteboard, you get a nice high-level picture. Nice big chunky boxes, modules, components, and services. If you reverse engineer a diagram automatically from that code base, you don't get the same picture. The reverse engineered picture is very low level, very, very accurate, but it doesn't necessarily match the mental model that the engineer has of the system. Again, the two different things here. So in other words, we often write classes and interfaces and packages, but we're really thinking in different terms. How do we normally do this? Right, let's bring this back to code again. How do we normally do this? Let's imagine we're building the, mode, the, the world's most boring web app, which is basically what most of us are doing anyway. <laughs> I'm glad you agree. So one of the things we normally do in our web apps is, is we break it up into layers. So we might have a, a presentation layer at the top with all our web app controllers in, and if we're doing like a web MVC thing. We might have some sort of business or service layer in the middle, doing important business logic, of course. And we might have some sort of data access thing at the bottom. Traditional, standard, layered architecture. Why do we do this? Because that's what we're told to do. This is a picture I ripped out of a Spring book from somewhere. It basically says, this is how you should do Spring MVC applications. You turn the page, it tells you why. Separation concerns, modularity, testing, so on and so forth. You download some sample projects off the web. It already has this architecture built into it. You know, there's one package per layer. You go into Stack Overflow, you ask a question, how do I structure my code base? It says, oh, I'll do this. So there's lots of content pushing us towards a layered architecture here. This is not, new, uh, this is not unique to the Java world, of course. Um, other technologies, other frameworks, exactly the same. The whole purpose and concept of a, a layered architecture is, is really separation of concerns and modularity. So you know, as, a, as, as someone implementing business logic, if I need access to data, I don't care about all that horrible JDBC stuff. I just want my data. So there's a nice set of clean interfaces I can use. If I'm building the front end, I don't care about all that back end stuff. I just want nice clean interfaces. So it, it, it's, a, it's all about separation concerns, essentially. Often what we do is we apply a set of principles or rules on top of these layered architectures. Things like a strictly layered architecture where all arrows go one way. So in other words, dependencies flow one way through your code base. And again, this is a very, very typical starting point for most code bases. The problem is, in, in technologies and, and languages like Java, if all of these red boxes here are layers, and they're implemented by packages, well, most of these things need to be made public, because they're, they're need, they need to be accessed outside of that package. And so what you end up seeing with most code bases is, is that lots of stuff is made public when it really shouldn't be. And the problem with making lots of stuff public is you can call it from anywhere. So although this starts out as a really nice thing in theory, in practice, you often get stuff like that. I've run workshops with, with teams, and I've said, draw me a picture of your layered architecture, and they draw the previous picture. I'm like, that's beautiful. Now show me your actual code. And it looks like that. I'm like, you just lied to me. 
So of course, you know, your controllers can bypass your servers and go straight to your data access object. And this happens a lot. It happens because lack of discipline, code reviews, you know, lots and lots of reasons. This is just one approach, of course. Hexangle architectures, ports and adapter architectures, clean architectures, onion architectures. These are typically layered architectures as well, and I'll come back to that point in a second. The whole layers thing, is that bad? Should we be considering layered architectures as evil or harmful? And I think that's a bit of an, a stretch, an exaggeration, but one of the key concepts here is that our layers are not really the same as other layers. If you look at something like the OSI networking stack with the seven layers, those layers are very, very different from our you know, controllers, services, data access layer thing. Um, there's a great talk by Ralph uh, Westphal. If you skip to about 13 minutes in this talk, he does this whole comparison between software layers and OS layer layers, and they're totally, totally different. And that's one of the reasons some of our layered architectures don't work as well as we think they should. We're applying the wrong patterns, essentially. Cargo cult. Applying stuff because we think we should, but we don't really know why. This happens a lot in our industry. Maybe layering is another cargo cult. Maybe we just blindly apply layering because that's what we think we should do. The rationale behind layering is good, but maybe we're just doing it wrong somehow. Maybe the layers are important, but they're not as important as we think they are. Maybe something else is more important, or maybe the layers are just an implementation detail. Yeah, so maybe we should flip this whole thing on its head. Uncle Bob Martin uh, wrote a blog post a while back called Screaming Architecture. And he basically said, if you look at you know, the blueprints for a house or a library, those blueprints scream something about the functionality and purpose of that building. If you look at most software systems, you know, if you open the code in your IDE and look at the top level folders or packages, they all basically look the same. Web app controllers, services, repositories. And he said, maybe you should flip this on its head. And maybe our code bases should scream something about the business capabilities or the domain concepts rather than technical things. Martin Fowler said the same thing. He said, you know, we often do this layering thing, presentation layer, domain layer, data layer. And actually, that's a good way to start. If you have a small code base, this is a good way to start. But once you have a system of any size or complexity, the layering thing starts to break down very, very quickly. And you need to introduce modularity inside the layers as well. And he says another approach is to layer vertically. And the vertical layers here really reflect domain concepts, aggregate routes and DDD, for example, business capabilities, and so on. So of course, there's no single right way to structure a code base here. Uh, this is often called package by feature. So in Java terms, what we do is, is we, we stick all of the stuff related to thing A in a package for thing A, similarly with thing B. This doesn't necessarily solve any problems. It's just a different way to structure code. Coming back to the model code gap, George Fairbank says we can solve a lot of this with uh, an architecturally evident coding style. An architecturally evident coding style is essentially dropping hints and metadata into your code so that your code actually reflects your architectural intent. There are lots and lots of ways to do this. Um, naming conventions is one way. So if you have a logging component on your architecture picture, make sure something in the code is called logging components, maybe an interface, for example. Maybe it's about namespacing or packaging conventions. Maybe you have one namespace or package per component boundary. Uh, maybe it's about adding machine-readable metadata, so annotations, for example, at component. Um, OSGI and Java 9, you know, maybe it's about creating those module boundaries and saying a module equals a component, and so on and so forth. So there are lots and lots of techniques that we can use here to make our code better reflect our architectural intent. 
This is a really, really great idea, but I don't see many people actually doing this in practice for some reason. The way that I do this is uh, something I call package by component. And what I'm really trying to do here is I'm, really, I'm trying to use Java's packaging mechanism as a way to encapsulate component functionality. So the way I'll do this is I'll say that, well, all, all of my web controllers are really separate components. And I'm going to bundle up, in, in many cases, you know, the service and the data access objects that form one logical thing. To give you a, a more concrete example, if we take my tweet component again, so this is what it looked like before. There was a tweet service interface and a, a default tweet service implementation class and a data access and a Mongo data access. What I've done now is I've basically bundled all of that code into a single Java package. I've renamed this tweet service thing to be tweet component. So now it matches my diagram. That thing was horribly named, but now it's also horribly named. It's called tweet component impl. But I've made it package protected. So I don't really care what it's called. It's package protected. It's just an implementation detail. And I've taken this MongoDB tweet thing and stuffed it here. Again, I've made that package protected. And actually, I've hard-coded these two things together. So what I have here is a component represented by a Java package. I have a public interface and some private or package protected in, uh, implementation details. This is what the code looks like. There's my package over here. All of the code, in fact, my spring config sits in that package. And I've added a little annotation here. So I can, I can signify that this, is, this thing is a component. And now when we jump from the component diagram back to the code, so we have our component diagram here. There's our tweet component. We highlight it. We pinch the zoom in. Hooray, we get something that matches. And that's really what I'm trying to go for here. I'm, I'm really trying to bridge that gap between architecture and code to make sure all of these things align. And I want to get people thinking once again about modularity as a, as a thing we care about, modularity as a principle. Right, so what are the real boundaries here? The irony of all of this, of course, is, is microservices. If, if you ask people, how do you create a microservices architecture, they'll basically say, well, we create a bunch of code, and then we wrap it up with a nice, clean services interface. And if you want access to that code, you go through the service interface. Public service interface, private implementation details. And now you ask them, how do you build a monolithic system? And they say layers. Like, why are we doing the two different approaches? Why can't we have impermeable boundaries regardless of how we're deploying our apps? So this is the microservice style approach. We bundle the code up. We stick a nice service interface on top. Why can't we do that in a monolithic system as well? Nice public interface with inside our monolith with a bunch of package protected, in this case, implementation code. In order to do this, you need to make a bunch of design decisions. And you need to ask yourself, well, how do we actually design software? What's, what's our way of doing this? For example, what's your, what's your decomposition strategy? If you're having a whiteboarding session to come up with a list of candidate classes or components that you're going to use to implement a system, how do you come up with that candidate list? There are lots and lots of different ways to do this, of course. Um, if you go to the Wikipedia page on decomposition, procedural decomposition, not suggesting you should do that. Functional decomposition, also not suggesting you should do that. Um, modules, abstract data types, IO, there are lots and lots of different decomposition strategies. And this all comes back to you know, the, the Parnas paper from the 1970s, which if you've not read it, it's definitely worth a read. Parnas basically, uh, basically says, here's a really simple system, and this is what the design looks like if we apply two different decomposition strategies. And the designs are hugely different. And the implications of, the, of those designs is also hugely different. And it's not one is better than the other, but that there are just different, you know, different flexibilities, different capabilities, different trade-offs that we're making here. If you have a bunch of things talking to one another, whether it's microservices or you know, components in a monolith, how do they interact? Is it all synchronous? Is it asynchronous? Is it messages? Is it commands? Is it events? 
lots of the conversations I hear um, from people who are building microservices architectures, you can also apply to a monolithic system too. You know, just because you have all, your, all of your code in a single deployment unit, it doesn't mean your components can't send messages or events between each other. That could either be on a, you know, an external network-based bus, like a message queuing system, or it could be uh, on an internal asynchronous thing. Where do you put your domain classes? Do you put your domain classes in your components and modules, or do you have this big bag of other stuff? Again, whether you're doing something like DDD or ports adapters will take you down a certain route or not. Where do you put shared code and utilities in your monolith? Again, all of these discussions we have or, or we hear when people are doing microservice architectures too. It also applies to data. Most monolithic systems also have a big monolithic database. And normally it's that database that's really hard to carve up. But again, if you think about your monolith as being made up of lots of small self-contained things, you can apply these same sorts of decisions to your data structures. Are we throwing all of the data into one single big Oracle database with lots of um, you know, foreign keys between these things? Or are we using polyglot persistence? Does component A in our monolith store stuff in Oracle and component B in Mongo? Right? That's absolutely fine. You can do that. And all of these things basically need to be conscious decisions. That's the hard part about software development. It's about conscious decisions. It's about making decisions. It's about doing design. The trick is, of course, the devil is really in the detail here, and specifically the implementation details. Let's go back to our really boring web app. Let's imagine we're building a boring web app, and it's doing something with customers and customer data. All right, here are four separate UML class diagrams for you. Starting from the left, this is what a UML class diagram might look like if, you, if you've adopted a layered architecture. So you might have a customer controller sitting in a kind of web controller package. There's a services package, and there's a data access package. So that's a, a traditional kind of layered architecture approach. Number two, this one here, uh, this is what a ports and adapters or hexagonal style might look like. So uh, for those of you who don't know what a, a, a hexagonal style of architecture is, basically there's an inside and an outside. On the inside is all of your business domain stuff. And on the outside is all of your technology stuff. And the outside points to the inside. All dependencies flow to the inside. So all of our business logic is stuck here in the middle. All of our customer business logic. The web controller depends on the business logic. And the data access thing depends on that interface. So again, you'll see dependencies flowing inwards. This one here is a, a package by feature approach. So here we have a customer package with all of the classes inside it. And this is what I do. So I keep my, my UI separate from my components. So this is my you know, customer component with a bunch of stuff inside it. They all look different, don't they? And they can be different. The problem is, lots of the examples I see on the internet, if you go look at these things on GitHub and, and you try and find examples of, say, a, a, a hexagonal architecture, most examples make all of the Java types public. The problem with having all of the types as public is you're not using the packaging mechanism Java gives you. And all you're doing is you're using packages like folders, essentially using packages as a way to organize code rather than encapsulation. This is a really, really neat trick. So let's go back to that same diagram and remove the packages. Because if all the types are public, the packages don't really matter. All the four approaches are now exactly the same. The boxes are in different locations, but all the implementations are exactly the same. And that's really weird. It's funny, I, um, I, I, I did the same talk at DevOps France a few weeks back, and we tried really hard to find a canonical uh, ports and adapters implementation that didn't use Java public types, and we couldn't find one. 
which begs the question, what really is the difference between, between all of these architectural styles? Because they're conceptually different, but syntactically the same, if you make all the types public. Of course, we can use Java's packaging mechanism to provide some level of encapsulation here. You can think of this as like a poor man's Java 9 module system. If we bring back the packages and fade out the classes that we can make more restrictive using the standard access modifiers, you get something that looks like this, which is kind of really interesting. So because the controller depends on the service interface, we can make the implementation class package protected. No one needs to know about it. Ditto with the DAO. In the ports and adapters thing, it's exactly the same. So that's why I said a ports and adapters or hexagonal style of architecture is typically implemented in the same way a layered architecture is. If you're doing a package by feature approach, that's your public entry point into the package, and then all of this stuff can be made essentially private, package protected. And this is my approach. I have a public component interface, and all of the rest is package protected. This is really interesting because it allows me to use Java's packaging mechanism for encapsulation purposes. But furthermore, there's a really interesting um, trade-off around testing here. There was a great paper a while back by Jim Kapleen. And uh, he basically says mo why most unit testing is wasteful. Anybody seen this? You should definitely, definitely go check this out if you've not seen this. Um, basically, he says, if you look back 10 or 20 years, the reason we, we do lots of stuff we do now is because of these reasons. Um, one is performance. So you're writing a bunch of code that accesses a database. You want to write really fast running unit tests. So what do you do? You mock out your database. Well, it's 2016. That's not as true as it was 10 or 20 years ago. We now have fast hardware. We've got Docker. We've got Vagrant. We can spin up database environments really quickly. So a lot of the reasons we used in the past have now disappeared. Uh, that paper produced a whole bunch of follow-up, including one from DHH, the Rails guy, basically saying, look, we're breaking our system up into lots of really, really tiny, small parts, and it's wrecking our nice, clean design. He called it test-induced design damage. Again, some of this stuff is, re is really worth reading. You probably won't agree with all of it. I don't. There's some really, really good stuff in here. If we go back to my tweet component, this is what I ended up with. I have a public tweet component interface, an implementation class, and a Mongo DB tweet DAO. In the old world, if I wanted to unit test this, I would unit test this and create a mock one of these. Again, that's one of the benefits of layered architecture, is it allows us to introduce a mock at a lower level. In this new world, that's a bit trickier to achieve. There's no easy way to substitute a mock tweet DAO into this thing here, because it's hardwired. And I want to get people thinking about testing. I think we're just blindly following the same approach to testing as well as layering. I was at the XP conference in Edinburgh a couple of weeks ago, and I got thrown onto a, uh, onto a panel discussion about the testing pyramid of all things. All right, this is the typical testing pyramid, which is not a pyramid, it's a triangle, but whatever. The advices do lots of you know, very fast unit tests, then have a, a set of slower running integration tests on top, and then if you're really lucky, you get a bunch of functional UI stuff on top of that. This, of course, doesn't address all of the non-functional testing, but let's ignore that for a second. My big problem with the, with the testing triangle pyramid thing is that nobody understands what a unit is. For some people, a unit is a unit of behavior, a unit of functionality. For other people, a unit is a single method or class. If we can't agree what a unit is, what are we integrating? Well, we're integrating units. Well, brilliant. For most people, an integration test is something slow that talks to a database, for example, or a third-party service. Uh, and this whole, term, this, this whole terminology is just bonkers. If you start to apply a more modular approach to your code base, you get to make some decisions. You get some options, actually. Imagine this is my Java package. 
and I have a public service interface and a bunch of implementation classes that are package protected. I could unit test this thing by providing a mock one of these, a mock repository. That's the typical approach we, we take. And I also see teams, you obviously want to test your real repository code, so they spin up a database and they write a bunch of quite fragile, brittle integration tests that test this thing against the database. Why don't we just test the whole thing as a black box? Why don't we just do high-level component tests through the whole thing? Spin up a database, go through the public API, and test a bunch of stuff that way. It's an option you have. If you're doing a microservices architecture, that's probably what you'll do. You'll write a bunch of microservices, and then you'll have a service-based test. So what I'm saying here is really think. Think about the design and think about your testing strategy. Don't blindly apply the let's mock out the entire world and, and test everything in you know, tiny, tiny levels of isolation. Maybe there are some bigger chunks you can test in a much, much easier way. Now, of course, a bunch of caveats apply. This works really well if you own the entire stack. So if you're building really, really simple CRUD components, yeah, you can spin up your own database and call through your, your own public API. That's really easy to do. If your component talks to a third-party service, well, then you probably need to introduce a mock. If your component starts sending stuff out asynchronously, well, then you need a, a mock to do that too. My whole thing about the testing pyramid or the testing triangle is I think we should align it much more with the architecture and the structure of our systems. And I also want to change the terminology. So I want to get away from this unit testing thing and let's, let's actually call these tests what they're testing. So when I'm building my systems, I have a bunch of class level tests and these test individual classes one at a time, mocking out things around them if that's appropriate. These are very quick running. These are basically what we call unit tests. Shifting one level up, if I do have a nice modular monolithic system with components inside it, I can have a bunch of component tests. And they do exactly what they say on the tin. They spin up the component as a whole thing. They go through the public interface, and they test a bunch of paths through it. And of course, you can have system level tests on top. It's no accident that these names correspond to the abstractions I showed you before. A system is made up of containers, containers contain components, components are made up of classes. Please don't quote me on this next slide. In fact, please don't take a photo of this next slide because you'll get me into trouble. I want to achieve the maximum amount of code coverage from a test perspective by writing the minimal amount of code I can possibly get away with. Now, obviously, there are extremes here. So unit testing everything in isolation is one extreme, and that's what I see lots of teams doing. On the other hand, writing one gigantic acceptance test that tests your entire system through Selenium, that will get you a lot of coverage very quickly. It's not a particularly good idea. Right? And there's a, there's a sweet spot somewhere in the middle. And that's why I think that triangle thing is not really a triangle. It's some other shape. And, and I don't really care about the shape, but what I want to do is make sure that the architecture of your system the way you think about your system matches the code, and the code matches the tests, and the tests reflect the architecture. All of these things are linked. I think that's really kind of interesting because it, it joins the gap between the coding side of things and the architecture side of things. Why is all this important? What do I think is important? It's, it's basically about maintainability. The maintainability, you can say, is inversely proportional to the number of public things, whether they are classes or, or microservices. And basically, the, the more dependencies you have, the harder it gets. And you've probably seen this. If you have a big ball of mud, it's really hard to maintain and look after. If you have a nice, well-structured code base, well, that's good. A well-structured code base, a good architecture, gives you agility. People say, how can we get agility from our code base? Make it structured. Agility. The ability to move fast. The ability to respond to change. How much of that do you need from your system? 
For some of us, we might want to move really fast. For others in the room, we can tolerate moving at a slightly slower pace because we're building different types of systems. I think quality, uh, sorry, I think agility is a quality attribute. It's a non functional requirement. If you take how much agility you need into account, that's what can help you figure out what style of architecture to build. You know, whether it's a, a monolithic thing down here or something a bit more service based, microservices, for example. And of course, these are not, well, these are extremes, but there is something in the middle. Something in the middle is, you know, a modular monolith. A monolithic system where it's easy to deploy, but we still have a bunch of nice encapsulated modules or components inside that thing. If you do this middle thing well, if you have a really nice, well-structured monolithic system, it's a fantastic stepping stone towards a microservices architecture. If you get your seams and your boundaries right, you can carve out that thing and turn it into a service. Turning it into a service presents a bunch of trade-offs. You know, that's, a, a, that's a, a big decision in its own right. But in doing that, you get a bunch of other benefits. You know, if you move to a microservices style of architecture, you get things that are individually deployable, replaceable, substitutable. You can build them in different technologies and so on and so forth. So for me, moving to a microservices architecture is something you only do if you want these types of benefits. If you just want a nice, clean code base that gives you agility, you can get that with a monolith, if you do it right. So basically, choose microservices if they give you benefits. If they don't, leave them for now. And of course, you can always have, you can always have a hybrid architecture. You know, a couple of monoliths talking to a bunch of microservices, that's absolutely fine. You don't need to go the whole hog and make everything a microservice. Design thinking. This all comes back to design thinking and making sure your seams and your boundaries are right. Because if they're not, you basically just get a distributed big fall of mud. And that, I can honestly see teams cleaning this stuff up in like two or three or four or five years. You'll go into an organization and they said, yeah, in 2016, we did the microservices thing. And now everything is so slow because it's all coupled with REST. Great. A couple of, couple of slides to finish with. You know, if your software system, if your code base is hard to work with, change it. Some of the things I've spoken about here are really, really easy to do. They're really, really simple refactorings with inside a monolithic code base. And a lot of this comes back to aligning how you think about the architecture of your system with what the code actually looks like. Definitely go read up on George Fairbanks' architecture living and coding style. You know, naming conventions, annotations, namespacing and packaging. There are lots of ways we can get those architectural ideas into our code base to create um, more well-structured, more modular monoliths. One concrete piece of advice, and I, I gave this exact same piece of advice here last year, stop making everything public. I don't know how we do this, apart from chopping people's fingers off. No, I don't know. It's just, you know, some of the frameworks push us to create everything as public. We just do it out of habit. Charity donation. Every time you do this without thinking, charity donation. That might work. You know, start thinking consciously about how you're using the basics like, Java, like the Java access modifiers. And in time, hopefully, you'll get to create more well-structured applications. And that's really the thing here. If you can't build a well-structured monolith, please don't do the microservices thing. Thank you very much. So we have five minutes left, so we've got time for some questions before the keynote, if anyone wants to ask anything. At the back. So um, the question is, if you're doing the bigger tests, how do you deal with all the combinations of different test cases? Um, and, and the answer is, 
Sometimes you need to do some low-level tests to get that coverage and supplement them with the high-level stuff. So again, you can take a, a kind of combined approach here to get the best of both worlds. And Yeah, yeah, and, and, and sometimes I, I, I have a bunch of low-level class tests um, that test some of the more complex logic and some of the complex scenarios with the simpler stuff tested, you know, straight end-to-end. -end. Uh, and the code coverage tools are your friend. That'd be my advice, Eric. Any other questions? I'll be around at the conference drinks if anyone wants to ask me questions then. Nope? Cool. Thank you very much.